Thank you. Good afternoon. We have introduced a series of measures in recent weeks to slow down the spread of COVID-19 infections. We have stopped higher risk activities such as dining in. We have also moved schools to home-based learning. We have made work from home as a default. As we continue to battle the COVID-19 outbreaks, vaccination now plays a very important role. Vaccination remains effective in providing protection against COVID-19 infections. While there have been cases of vaccine breakthroughs, vaccination is still very effective in preventing severe disease outcomes, as well as complications, as we have seen, even against these new variants. It will also help to slow down infections significantly. We have made good progress for those aged 45 and above. We will begin to start with a younger cohort shortly. We will also be starting the vaccination of children aged 12 and above. At the same time, we have been exploring ways to accelerate the vaccinations so as to protect as many as possible and as early as possible. This is particularly important as there are several unlinked cases every day suggesting the presence of community infections. By providing vaccination to more, will help to slow down infection and protect against severe outcomes. Minister Ong Yi Kang mentioned this earlier and we would like to share more shortly. Before I invite uh, Minister Ong, I would like to ask Director of Medical Services to give us an update on the medical side. Kenneth? Thank you, Minister. As of the 18th of May 2021, the Ministry of Health has preliminarily confirmed 27 new cases of locally transmitted COVID-19 infection, of whom 16 are linked to previous cases, 11 are currently unlinked. Among them, 14 had been placed on quarantine earlier. Now, based on our investigation so far, the cases are in the community and there are no new cases in the dormitories. In addition, there are 11 imported cases who had already been placed on a stay-home notice on arrival in Singapore. Of these, six are returning Singaporeans or Singaporean permanent residents. In total, there are 38 new cases of COVID-19 infection in Singapore today. We're still working through the rest of the details of the cases and this will be made available through a further update to be shared via MOH's press release later tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me first thank Minister Gan Kim Yong for staying as a co-chair of the committee and be able to provide guidance to newbies like me. Uh, I want to follow up on the few points that he mentioned just now in his introduction. Uh, starting with vaccination, our vaccination program is progressing well. So far, we have administered more than 3.4 million doses of COVID-19 vaccine, and this covers close to 2 million individuals of our population. So they have received at least the first dose of the vaccine. And amongst these 2 million, 1.4 million of them have received both doses and have completed the full vaccination regimen. Um, so in terms of percentages, uh, overall vaccination take up rate, that is encouraging. For seniors aged 60 and, 60 and above, 71% um, of them have received their vaccination or booked their vaccination uh, appointments. As for those aged 45 to 59, 66% of eligible persons have done so. Um, to facilitate the vaccination of homebound persons. Uh, we know especially many of our elderly, they are confined at home. They are unable to go to the vaccination centers. So to help them, um, the Ministry of Health, we have been working with the Health Promotion Board and also AIC, our agency for integrated care, to deploy home vaccination teams for this group. So the team will comprise a doctor plus a nurse so that we can vaccinate these homebound persons in the comfort of their home. Next, for those aged 40 to 44 years old, thank you very much for your patience and understanding. Um, registration for you will open from 19th of May tomorrow. Another piece of good news is that the Health Services Authority, HSA, 
has also extended authorization for the use of the Pfizer BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine for individuals aged 12 to 15 years. And the expert, our expert committee on COVID-19 vaccination has also weighed in on that endorsement, with their endorsement. So both teams have assessed that the Pfizer BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine demonstrated high efficacy and safety for this age group of 12 to 15, and which is consistent with what we have observed uh, for the adult population. So MOH will work with the Ministry of Education, will provide a allocation, and MOE will plan out the vaccination for this group, which are all in schools, and MOE will provide further updates soon. Let me now move on to what I talked about last week. Was it last week? When I talked about the possibility of uh, expand, extending the gap between dose one and dose two, I explained that at that time, if I may recap, the earlier phase of vaccination so far, we have been focusing on people who need it the most, vulnerable groups, as well as those uh, on our front lines. And we give them two doses, give them maximum protection. Now that we move on to younger groups, there is um, merit to think about how to do it differently, giving priority to first dose so that we cover as many of our population or as big a proportion of our population as possible. So the expert committee on COVID-19 vaccination has studied this and they have assessed that the maximum interval between the mRNA COVID-19 vaccines could be extended up to eight weeks to maximize vaccine coverage without materially impacting the eventual overall immune response, as long as the second dose is eventually administered. This conclusion corroborates with the data from the original mRNA trials, which has been boasted recently by emerging information from real-world observations lab studies, as well as simulations. The approach of prioritizing first dose vaccinations has also been adopted by other countries, such as the United Kingdom, as well as Germany. We will therefore expedite access to vaccines for more people, given our supplies, by extending the interval between the first and second vaccine doses, which is now three to four weeks. We will extend it to six to eight weeks. And this will apply to vaccination registrations that occur from tomorrow. Maybe if I were just uh, roughly explain how this work, intuitively is this. Every, every time you, vac you give someone a vaccine for the first dose, three weeks later, if you are taking Pfizer, they will be back to take the second dose. When you extend it, basically that demand is pushed back by another three, four, five weeks, which means you free up that dosage for that day for more people to take the first dose. And that's how it works. And the end point is the same, which is to at the end, everyone will get their two doses. But now we prioritize giving out more first doses early and then more second doses later. Yeah? End point is actually the same. The difference is that we are trying to instead uh, of having a good number of people getting maximum protection, we make sure we get the maximum number of people get good protection. Yeah. In, in Chinese, yi qi hao yi xie ren de dao zui duo de bao hu, dao bu ru gei zui duo de ren de dao yi xie hao de bao hu. So I think that is the shift in the priority. So let me assure everyone, the second dose will be given. It's just that we push it back from three to four weeks to six to eight weeks. Second is that the first dose is effective based on international studies, based on the opinion of our immunologists, based on the expert opinion of our expert community. Uh, expert committee, and it is also done in other countries, such as UK and Germany. 
who also prioritize first dose and it worked very well for them. And those who have already booked your appointment for your second dose, rest assured, it will not be affected. However, amongst those who have booked but volunteer to push back your second dose appointment so that that dose can be given to someone else for their first dose, please do so. You can call our vaccination call center. Uh, the number is, is a 1-800 number. It's 1-800-333-9999. Then 9999, okay? So you can, you can do that and you will do another Singaporean a favor. So with that, uh, we will expect in May, for the rest of May, we will be able to vaccinate another 300,000 individuals, first dose. In June, 700,000 Singaporeans, or 700,000 individuals, first dose. And July, 1.3 million individuals, first dose. Altogether, we will be able to reach 4.3 million vaccination, vaccinated individuals by end of July. Status quo, we would have reached 3.9 million. But with this new strategy of prioritizing first dose, we will reach 4.3 million. So 400,000 more individuals will be vaccinated. It also means if all goes smoothly, sometime in August, about 4.7 million individuals will be covered by vaccination, at least one dose. This will substantively cover all our eligible population, almost all our eligible population. Um, let me end my presentation with a final word about Tan Tok Seng. It has been very difficult at this time to lose one of our hospital, but it is recovering progressively, steadily, and there's good light at the end of the tunnel. So it's a good sign that as of today, Tan Tok Seng from 8 a.m. today is starting to take in patients again and slowly, cautiously recovering. And it has been more than one incubation cycle of 14 days since the last case of exposure at TTSH has been detected. Uh, safety of patients, staff continues to be paramount importance. So TTSH will open up progressively and steadily and carefully. Patients are regularly swapped, and so are staff, who are also working in segregated zone and split teams in the coming two weeks. And so far, all their test results have come back negative, which is why for one incubation cycle, there's been no more exposure detected. So I want to really thank all the TTSH staff. Although I'm a new health minister, I, I can understand what they are going through. And also a good proportion, I think a quarter or a third of the staff are actually quarantined. But the rest of the staff pressed on and continue to deliver critical health services. And this, I hope, will be a very happy week because many of the quarantine staff are progressively coming back in the course of this week. And so let's continue. I, I know great, great majority of Singaporeans are solidly behind TTSH. So let's thank them all and continue to cheer them on and give them our support. Thank you. Good afternoon. This is a very critical period for all of us in our fight against COVID-19. We know that the new variants are much more infectious than what we had to deal with last year. And there is growing evidence that the new variants can spread through aerosolized particles, which means that all the precautions we are used to, in fact, may not be sufficient to safeguard against the spread of the virus. And we need even more stringent measures. And that's why in the recent days, we have stepped up, tightened up the measures, including uh, measures like stopping dining in for F&B establishments and having students um, go back home and engage in full home-based learning. But we also need to recognize that there is a time lag with the measures that we introduce. I think we 
for those of you who have been following this for some time, you would be familiar with this. In other words, the cases that we are picking up now, in fact, were seeded very likely one to two weeks ago. And we will continue to see you know, many cases as we pick them up, even unlinked cases as we are seeing now, precisely because of how infectious and transmissible the new strains are. It doesn't mean that our measures are not working. In fact, I have confidence that the latest measures that we have put in place to restrict interactions and movement will have an impact in bringing numbers down. But we will only see this materialising one to two weeks later because of the time lag in these uh, measures. So what it means is we will continue to assess the situation very carefully. We will consult our public health experts and we will continue to see if there is a need to do any further tightening, whether the current measures are sufficient or whether there is a need to do any further tightening along the way. Uh, meanwhile, we have to do everything we can, all of us, to do our part to stop, uh, to slow down the spread of the virus. And that means several things. Number one, the vaccination program has to be ramped up, as Minister Ong described just now. We will be offering vaccinations to more people with this more aggressive first dose strategy. And so if you have the chance to be vaccinated, please take it up as soon as possible. Second, stay home as much as you can. Stay home and go out only for essential activities. I think that will certainly help to break the transmission chain because if you are at home, you're not going out, then there is no likelihood for the virus to spread. So stay home and go out only for essential activities. And finally, if you really have to go out, take additional precautions. In particular, if you are going out to an enclosed space with people in close proximity, make sure you wear a mask with high filtration capability. It's not just wearing a cloth mask, but wear one with high filtration capability, a surgical mask or one of those with the filter inserts. That is important because of the latest evidence about the nature of the variant strains, how transmissible they are, and the fact that spread can happen through aerosolized particles. Finally, I want to thank Singaporeans and everyone in Singapore for cooperating with the measures so far and taking the latest restrictions in your stride. I think all of us can see the evidence around us. The streets are quieter. People are scaling back activities. And when they go out, you are going out in twos, which is in compliance with the rules. I know this has been very difficult and disruptive for all of you. And I want to thank you for doing your part to curb the spread of the virus. So let's hunker down. We keep our spirits up, continue to support each other, and we can get through this bump together. Thank you. Thank you. Now I invite uh, questions from the media. Thank you, Ministers, DMS, members of media, press materials have been sent. Please note that all materials are embargoed until after the end of the press conference. We will now begin with the Q&A segment. Media agencies, please remember to use the raise hand function on Zoom if you'd like to ask a question. Do also remember to unmute before asking your question. Kindly note that we will only take one question per media to allow more to participate. I repeat, please only ask one question each. Thank you. May we have the first question from Esti. Salma, please. Right. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Right. Uh, first, I want to applaud the decision that uh, to give as many people as possible at least one uh, vaccine dose. I think that's a great thing to do. The question is, uh, why six to eight weeks? Why the delay of six to eight weeks? Because literature has been showing that a longer delay actually improves the immunity. I believe Britain did a study with uh, people over 80 years old, uh, slightly under 200 of them, 
And they found that uh, people who got the second Pfizer dose 11 to 12 weeks after their first had a 3.5 times better uh, response, antibody response, than those who got it three weeks after the first. So it seems to be a longer uh, interval is actually better. So why aren't we going for a longer period? Because that would mean uh, a lot more people being able to get their first dose early. And when you say six to eight weeks, do you mean people have a choice? Do I choose whether I want it, uh, my second dose six weeks or seven weeks or eight weeks? Or is it decided for me by someone? Uh, Samuel, thank you very much for the question. Uh, uh, the recommendation to move to six to eight weeks was uh, uh, based on the uh, evidence that was coming out from the original phase three trials, as well as uh, real world evidence where we, we were seeing uh, uh, individuals uh, having their vac vaccines uh, delayed and uh, studies showing that, in fact, immune protection was still relatively robust uh, in this group of people. Uh, I'm aware of this, the article that you're mentioning, which I understand would still be in preprint, and there were uh, some uh, uh, issues uh, that still have to be resolved in terms of whether or not eight weeks is the ideal, whether or not it's longer. But I understand even within the UK, some discussion still continues, and there is uh, some thinking that they may want to shorten the interval from where it is right now, moving it down even from 12 to eight weeks. So uh, across uh, different jurisdictions, different countries, we seem to... Uh, uh, be coming to some form of uh, agreement independently uh, that uh, it is acceptable to lengthen the dosing interval, uh, but it would probably be somewhere around the region of uh, six to eight weeks, which would be reasonable for us to uh, uh, to anchor on uh, at the onset, uh, allow for a good balance between providing more first doses, but also making sure that um, that we don't have that second dose kept too long away. Therefore, that those who receive their first dose then can still consolidate their immune response uh, with that second uh, uh, second dose to to uh, to amplify the the the, the, the benefit from uh, from the first vaccination. So we're going to uh, move to six weeks, uh, six to eight week uh, range, and then we'll reassess as the evidence uh, continues to evolve uh, to decide whether uh, a further adjustment of the dosing interval is needed. Salma, on your second question, how the my understanding is how the registration will work is that you book your first dose, then there's a window from six to eight weeks uh, when you can book your second dose. Thank you, DMS Minister. Can we get the next question from CNE? Jalila, please. Hi, um, I would like to find out um, what is wrong with the current masks being used and um, are they part of the reason behind the spread that we're seeing now, current masks being used? Thank you. Well, the, there is nothing wrong with the current mask being used, but what we are saying is based on the latest evidence of the new strains being more transmissible and the possibilities of aerosolized transmission. That simply means that the mask that you wear for protection ought to be of higher filtration capabilities. And that would mean wearing either a surgical mask or a reusable mask that is made of at least two layers of fabric. Um, this would include masks that have been issued by the People's Association and uh, the Masik Foundation. They have good filtration efficiency. But if you were just to take a simple piece of cloth and cover your mouth, that kind of a cloth mask may not have the same filtration capability and protective uh, effect as a mask that has a higher level of filtration capability like a surgical mask or one of these uh, higher quality reusable masks. And so that is the updated mask advisory that we are putting out today. Uh, DMS can elaborate further Maybe on this. Maybe I just add a few words before I hand over to DMS. I think it's probably useful to remind ourselves that uh, uh, the transmission of the infection is very often a multifactorial. It's not just a, a particular uh, reason or particular factor, it's not just because the mask, the quality of the mask, 
It's also because of the exposure, because of the safe distancing that uh, we have put in place that we may be able to prevent the transmission. So I think we have to take a look, uh, consider all the factors together as one basket of measures and not any particular measure. So we are doing what we can to strengthen each of these factors, whether it's through vaccination, through uh, strengthen uh, safe distancing measures, uh, whether it's through uh, uh, using of better masks and so on and contact tracing and so on. I, I think these are a collection of me measures that we have to put in place to strengthen our resilience against the infection. DMS. Indeed, Minister, uh, we've been looking very carefully at all the measures we put in place and all the exhortation and, and uh, guidance we've given the public. And at this time, when we see uh, additional community cases starting to come out, uh, and uh, given that the public have been uh, uh, having to deal with COVID-19 for the better part of 15, 16 months, uh, there will come a time when we uh, start getting uh, fatigued, complacent, uh, and we may not be necessarily as rigorous and disciplined in, in the, the protective measures we adopt for ourselves. So it's timely at this point in time for us to do several things. First of all, to continue to remind members of the public to adhere to safe distancing, uh, the prevailing safe management measures wherever they go, even though the uh, current community restrictions are in place, and uh, to be meticulous uh, about wearing their masks, to be very disciplined and only uh, to remove it if they are consuming food and drink. But even then, out of doors, given the current uh, restrictions, uh, to continually wear their masks, uh, that's important. And since we are uh, continuing to emphasize this, it actually is timely for us also to relook at the mask advisories we give. And we want to affirm and, and emphasize that it is important to use good quality masks, good quality masks worn well and properly provide an excellent form of protection for all of us against how the virus spreads, irrespective of whether it spreads by droplet or some form of aerosolized transmission. Wearing the good mask, wearing it properly makes sense and is, is the right thing to do. So we're sharpening the guidance and advisories we're giving uh, to make this uh, uh, clearer. Uh, we encourage uh, members of the public to use masks that are, have uh, adequate and decent filtration efficiency. These would normally be printed on the side of the packaging or box that uh, the masks uh, have to give you assurance that the masks that you purchase or procure have that adequate uh, uh, and reasonable quality. The masks that are, have been distributed in public and community programs, um, most if not all of them uh, do fit that um, that standard, uh, but it's important uh, that if you use disposal masks, be aware that the masks have a certain lifespan, and after uh, uh, you've used them and washed them uh, beyond the recommended uh, uh, number, uh, it's advisable then to change and replace those masks. Uh, but you can use either the reusable uh, mask or uh, the single-use disposal mask, like a surgical mask, and they do have adequate uh, uh, Efficient, um, filtration uh, effectiveness uh, that uh, is desirable. We continue to discourage the use of masks that have exhalation vents. These are masks that may make it more comfortable to use. They may be more appropriate uh, at times when there's haze and using the mask uh, for those purposes, but they would not be adequate from the public health and infection control perspective, uh, preventing infection spread if an infected person wears such a mask and there still continues to be a risk of droplet and aerosol transmission if a person sneezes or coughs from within those masks. So we want you to wear a good quality mask. A good quality mask worn badly is not good. Uh, it doesn't give you the, or the community any protection. So wear that mask properly and use a proper mask. Thank you, Ministers. DMS, can we get the next question from Chapao? Waiman, please. Hi, good afternoon, Ministers. Um, I was hoping, uh, can you help us understand what is the government's preliminary assessment of the economic impact of the latest round of heightened alert measures? Are we possibly looking at a uh, likely second round of budget measures? Um, also, can I mean, since we were talking about masks, can you share some I mean, reassurance on uh, mass supplies, given that now masks need to meet um, a stricter standard under the new advisory. Thank you. Well, the outlook is indeed very uncertain. I think prior to us 
entering this period of uh, the latest outbreak and the tightened measures, uh, we were projecting a recovery. MTI was looking at a growth rate of 4 to 6 percent. Uh, that was at that time because uh, we could see there was a certain momentum to economic activities recovering. It's very hard to say how things will pan out going forward. I think there will still be recovery, continued recovery in certain segments, um, but with the latest measures, and again, depending on how, how long this will last, how long some of the businesses, business entities will have to close, uh, then there will certainly be an impact. Overall, um, I think there's still a good chance we can achieve positive growth at the end of the year, but certainly there will be greater impact on certain segments. And that's why between MOF and MTI, we are continuing to monitor the economic situation very closely, and we will see uh, whether or not there is a need for additional help to help the affected businesses as well as workers. On mask supplies, I think we are in a much better position today compared to a year ago, so there is no need to rush. And we, the, the, the masks are available uh, you know, in all the shops, as well as we have done several rounds of distribution of reusable masks too. And as DMS said just now, uh, the reusable masks that were distributed by PA and the Masik Foundation do meet the uh, standards that we have uh, highlighted of having higher filtration effectiveness. So whether it is one of these reusable masks or surgical masks, the supplies are available and we would encourage everyone to make use, uh, to wear a good quality mask when you go out. Maybe uh, let me add on to the issue on the mask. Since the beginning of um, the pandemic last year, uh, MTI, uh, under my predecessor's uh, uh, charge, has uh, already put in place uh, production capacity uh, locally and uh, with uh, several companies. So currently we already have uh, local capability of producing um, surgical masks and we are also looking at uh, the possibility of continuing to ramp up our imports of uh, these uh, uh, surgical masks. We also have built up significant stockpile of these masks and therefore uh, I would assure Singaporeans that there's no need to panic and no need to uh, rush to buy uh, additional masks, to stock up masks. Just buy what you need and the supplies will continue and we will ensure that there's sufficient supply for all of us. Thank you, Ministers DMS. We'll take the next question from Reuters. Chen Lin, please. Uh, good evening, Ministers and DMS. Um, we understand that you are still evaluating the Sinovac uh, vaccine, but uh, what are the factors behind you know, it not yet having approved, even as other countries you know, have been rolling, uh, using it. And uh, what's the expiration date, you know, of the Sinovac shipment that we already received? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the question. Uh, as far as the Sinovac uh, vaccine is concerned, the Health Sciences Authority continues its evaluation uh, with a view towards uh, um, hopefully uh, approving it for use in Singaporeans, uh, but uh, they still have outstanding uh, items of uh, information they require from the manufacturer uh, in order to be assured that the vaccine is both safe and effective uh, for use. Uh, so uh, while we are waiting for that information, uh, HSC continues to do its due diligence. It's tracking uh, uh, how the, the vaccine is used in other countries and uh, exploring to see whether the information from how it's used in other countries could also uh, be part of the evaluation process. Uh, we are aware that the WHO is in the process of evaluating the vaccine uh, and uh, may come to a decision very soon on whether to approve uh, the vaccine for use as part of its global programs, providing access of uh, vaccines uh, to countries around the world. And if there were additional information that would be helpful for HSA's evaluation, uh, HSA will liaise uh, with uh, these other regulatory uh, agencies uh, uh, to help to uh, uh, help it to complete its process of evaluation. But HSA remains committed to making sure that if it approves the vaccines, uh, it will be on the basis of assuring Singaporeans that the vaccine is both safe and effective for use. The manufacturer uh, has uh, advised us that the, uh, the vaccine has a, a shelf life of up to two, two years. 
so, uh, so that's uh, what we have in mind at this point in time in terms of the uh, shelf life and expiry of the Sinovac vaccines that were already delivered uh, to us. Uh, but we continue to uh, evaluate it with a view towards seeing whether we could use these vaccines as early as is possible, provided they are approved for use in Singapore. Thank you, DMS. We'll get the next question from Asahi. Lee Wen, please. Hi, uh, there, there are some reports on the airborne transmission. So I would like to ask, how do you see about that? And then does this happen to the Tantoxen Hospital uh, cluster? Thank you. Uh, thank you again for the question. Uh, there are indeed uh, uh, reports have uh, been emerging, uh, um, suggesting a, a stronger uh, uh, possibility of uh, airborne transmission occurring in certain settings. Uh, they remain uh, settings particularly where there are close environments, limited airflow, poor ventilation, and these may indeed uh, provide an uh, 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 environmental setting that is conducive for spread of aerosolized droplets which may contain virus. So uh, there's more evidence uh, certainly at this time that seems to point towards this. But this remains one of several ways in which the virus uh, can uh, transmit. Uh, it, uh, the other ways are, are what we had uh, shared previously, including droplet transmission, uh, contamination of surfaces, and therefore when touching those surfaces and then touching either the mouth or the, the uh, nose or the eyes, uh, then some form of contamination spread can take place uh, through these routes. And these all remain uh, dominant uh, ways in which uh, the virus can transmit. It's just that we're adding on now the possibility in specific settings, uh, some level of uh, uh, aerosolized transmissions can also take place. We continue to study how the Tantoxing cluster emerged and how uh, spread had taken place. There are probably several factors. It may not be one single factor that may have contributed to spread to both staff and patients. You would need to have an infected person with a high viral load uh, and that would then uh, already, with a large amount of virus uh, uh, emanating from that person, then uh, perhaps supplemented by an environment which uh, was associated with um, some form of airborne transmission could plausibly have taken place. Uh, we are in the midst of uh, completing the, the uh, epidemiological investigations together with Tantok Singh, and we hope to have further information that will allow us to uh, assess about, uh, for this possibility. We are also looking at other clusters that have emerged uh, to see whether or not uh, um, the mode of transmission can also be elucidated. So it's not just Tantok Singh cluster that we're looking at. We also look at other settings. Uh, and in each of the settings, we try to assess whether it could plausibly be as a result of physical contact, as a result of droplet spread, or as you mentioned, the possibility of uh, aer uh, aerosolized transmission. So these are all possible ways in which uh, the virus can spread and infection can jump from one person to another. Can I just add something? I think as Minister Gan said just now, there are many modes of transmission, but I thought from the perspective of a member of our community and a member of our society, I think the past 15, 16 months, what they taught us is, I think the most, I think it's fair to say, the most common way of mode of transmission is still unmasked, in a crowded environment with a lot of ventilate, uh, without a lot of vocalization and interaction, and in an enclosed space, especially when ventilation is not good. So these are the conditions that usually lead to big spreading events. And I think these are the settings that we should be most careful about, which is why in this uh, latest set of measures, we deliberately remove activities that are taking place in those settings. Thank you, Minister. DMS, we'll take the next question from today. Nabila, please. Hi, all. Thanks for taking my question. Um, I just want to ask, earlier this year, uh, Minister Chan Chun Singh said Singapore is building a stockpile of locally made uh, filters that can add like an extra layer of filtration to reusable masks. Uh, do we know if this will be distributed? I mean, soon, because back then they said that uh, it will be distributed to the population if the COVID-19 situation worsens. 
Uh, currently, we do not have uh, plans yet to uh, directly distribute uh, these uh, fil filters. These filters are manufactured and they are available in the market, and we will assess the situation if we need to do, do a direct distribution, and we will then work with the relevant uh, agencies uh, to uh, uh, organize that for the people. Thank you, Minister. Can we get the next question from Tamil Murasu? Irshad, please. Good afternoon, Ministers and DMS. Uh, my question is regarding uh, the, those who uh, choose not to be vaccinated. Uh, for those, uh, will they affect the safety of the others in a public health perspective? And regarding masks, um, the, in recent day, you know, uh, recent months, some people have used masks as like a fashion statement. There are a lot of different designs uh, and people who uh, home, uh, homemade masks and all that. Um, how are we going to regulate or how will people know which is a good quality mask? Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much for the question again. Uh, I'll start off by addressing the first question you asked about those who uh, choose not to get vaccinated. Um, as you know, the vaccination program in Singapore is voluntary, but we have uh, strongly encouraged uh, those who, uh, who are eligible for vaccination to step forward to uh, avail themselves of this opportunity and get vaccinated. We believe very strongly that vaccination continues to provide a benefit. Uh, certainly, it uh, uh, is associated, the evidence shows uh, uh, that uh, it's associated with people getting less uh, uh, symptomatic uh, illness, uh, less severe illness. It doesn't necessarily prevent you from getting infection, but it makes you, you know, the risk of you getting an infection much less. It also reduces the ability for you to then tra transmit uh, infection to others. And this is a population level benefit. So the more people who get vaccinated, the greater the degree of, of protection the entire population enjoys. So we certainly uh, uh, want to see more people, as many people as possible, getting vaccinated. We do acknowledge and recognize that there are some people who are unable to get vaccinated, and they may be uh, unable to get vaccinated because they have medical contraindications, medical reasons for which they are not fit for vaccination. And there will also be those who are uh, uh, object for a variety of different reasons to getting themselves vaccinated. Uh, and, and we respect that choice at this time. Uh, but the rest of us then, if we have a sufficient percentage uh, of uh, people getting vaccinated, then the protection we enjoy can extend secondarily to them uh, in the population as a result of uh, us being less able to get infected and less able to transmit. Uh, but we want to get a percentage of people who are getting vaccinated as high as is possible. There's no absolute figure. We've mentioned that before in previous media conferences. But bearing in mind uh, that, uh, that we are starting to see viral variants of concern uh, starting to come in among uh, cases that we see, uh, it's uh, not unreasonable to, 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 to try and set a goal of at least 70-80% uh, of our population getting vaccinated. And that would be a, a goal, I believe, is easily achieved, can be achieved with determination from all of us, a commitment from all of us to get vaccinated. And we should certainly work towards getting as many people vaccinated as is possible. Can, can I also um, add that the question was asked about people who don't want to get vaccinated, but I think it's also important to remind all everyone who is vaccinated not to be complacent because we, we know that uh, the new strains are more resistant to the vaccines. There, are, there is some uh, chance of vaccine breakthrough. It doesn't mean that vaccination, vaccination doesn't work. It's still very effective and having vaccination will help reduce your likelihood of get, getting a severe disease. So it's very, very important. But because a vaccinated person may also uh, get infected, and when that person is, is infected, it may very well be a very mild um, flu-like flu symptoms or even be asymptomatic. And then that vaccinated person, if he's not careful, he or she is not careful, may go around becoming a carrier and spreading it to others. So it's very important. Um, we talk about encouraging unvaccinated persons to come forward and get vaccinated, but those who are vaccinated too do not be complacent and take all the necessary precautions very seriously. On mask, uh, we will be putting out some guidelines to help the public understand what the guidelines are so that they can also know what are the quality masks to go for. So those detailed guidelines will be coming up soon. 
I would say, you know, there is no need to limit your creativity and design to just cloth mask. Even with, you know, masks with good filtration capabilities, you can always find creative ways to design them. So creativity and design aside, I think the main, most important thing now is to get people to understand that there is uh, value in using masks with higher filtration capabilities and this offer better protection. So we will be putting out the detailed guidelines for the public to help people understand what these masks are. Maybe can I just add a bit on the point about um, individuals who don't want to get vaccinated? Uh, I come across many of them in my constituency as well. And I think for some people, they just need a bit more time as well. As DMSA, we have made this a voluntary program. The fact is we are constrained by supply. We have a steady stream of supply, but constrained by it. So we can only vaccinate as fast as supplies arrive. And we have a lot more demand than supply. So for this group that may need a bit more time, I think we also have to respect it because they are also weighing the risk and the benefit. And I think as more of us get vaccinated, I have seen many cases where their minds do change. When they uh, in those days when they can sit at a coffee shop, they talk left, right, centre, their friends, their relatives have all been vaccinated, they go home, they change their mind. Yeah. So I think just give them some time. Yeah. Thank you, Ministers. DMS, can we get the next question from BBC? Nicholas Marsh, please. Hello, everyone. Um, I just had a question. Minister Ong, I know you mentioned recently that this B1... Uh, 617 strain appears, appears to be affecting children more right now. So I was just wondering that given a good proportion of Singapore's most vulnerable have now been immunised against serious illness uh, and that children presumably during the course of this year will eventually be mixing in large groups again in schools, would there be a case for bringing children, the 12 to 15 cohort, to the front of the queue um, as they could be more at risk of transmitting this virus? I, I will invite DMS to answer this question. That day, during the conference, DMS was not with us because it's meant to be a doorstop, uh, more, more informal. But I was uh, expressing that view based on what I understand, that this variant um, affects more children compared to the previous variants. Yeah? Um, not a cross-population group, but compared to earliest, uh, earlier strains. Um, as to whether children should therefore come forward for vaccination, I think that also depends on approvals. And I think I better ask DMS to comment on that. Uh, thank you very much, Minister. It's certainly the case that uh, this year we've seen uh, uh, more uh, infections uh, being reported in children uh, compared to last year. Uh, and it could very well be associated with uh, viral variants of concern being more transmissible with higher viral loads. Uh, and then uh, uh, as a result of just that, the physical property of, uh, of these viral variants having a higher viral load, kids are also getting more infected as well. Uh, but, and if we look at the experience in other countries, in India and elsewhere, there have been reports uh, of uh, more children getting uh, uh, infected. At this point in time, uh, it isn't clear whether uh, infections in children lead to a more severe cause of a disease uh, uh, associated with uh, these viral variants of concern. Uh, certainly, uh, right now, based on our limited experience locally, uh, uh, these uh, children uh, are still relatively well. They are either mildly symptomatic or they are asymptomatic. Uh, and we uh, continue to keep a close watch on them, uh, to monitor them, and we I uh, hope they will continue to do well as they recover from these infections. Uh, but it's not uh, clear whether or not uh, with a higher uh, number of uh, children, whether or not we will see more utilization of hospital beds, more utilization of ICU beds, whether they will be more sick. And this is something we will continue to look very closely and watch uh, carefully. Certainly the children are concerned because uh, the, the, the children tend to mix quite uh, frequently with their peers, with their friends, uh, and it's harder to impress on uh, children uh, the need to comply with uh, the personal measures that we think are important to prevent spread uh, and prevent exposure, whether it's mandatory mask use uh, throughout all periods of time when you're actually not eating or drinking, whether it's uh, keeping a safe, safe distancing. It's something that we need to continue to remind kids a lot more than we would for, for, for adults, and therefore, 
children certainly can be uh, at, put at higher risk of getting infection simply because uh, they are less vigilant uh, and, and sometimes less uh, disciplined about uh, maintaining these, uh, these uh, protective uh, measures. Uh, so from that point of view, uh, we want to uh, uh, continue to teach uh, our kids and continue to uh, uh, encourage them to be disciplined in the same measures that will protect them as they do for adults. Uh, we'll continue to look at the data to determine whether uh, 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 giving them early vaccination uh, is helpful to also reduce the risk of them getting uh, um, infected. Uh, but uh, equally, we can protect and reduce the risk of their parents and adults around them getting infected. That also is a protective influence on the children. Uh, and uh, at this time, we have not made any decisions yet concerning uh, including children within our list of prioritised uh, groups of people for vaccination, but we will continue to watch this space, look at the evolving evidence, look at the community situation, and then make decisions uh, uh, later on as to whether or not we need to change our plans concerning prioritisation. But can I also chip in very quickly with one point on this uh, point on vaccination, that in fact we have multiple tracks in our vaccination programme. At the national level, we have been progressing on an age basis, starting with the seniors and then moving down by age bands. And today, you heard from Minister Ong, we are opening up, uh, henceforth going forward for the 40 to 44 age band. Separately, we've had an education track where we have looked at teachers, staff, students, and we have been in parallel moving on this track to vaccinate persons because of the risk, because of the nature of the work that they do. And, and so we have, been, um, we have started and we have rolled out vaccination, for example, for teachers. We have also done it for students who are living in university hostels because of the communal setting that they are in and the higher risk settings that they are in. And so we have done that as well. And so both MOH and MOE will be now looking at vaccination as a next step under the education track for school-going children, and we will update in due course. Thank you, Ministers. DMS, can we get the next question from Itartas? Evgeny, please. Uh, good evening. Thank you. Uh, uh, I want to ask about so-called vaccine passports. Uh, do you have any plans to introduce such uh, documents as a precondition for Singaporean uh, who wish going abroad and for foreigners uh, to enter Singapore? Thank you. Yeah. Um, right now we are focusing on suppressing our cases uh, in, in domestically. Um, but I always felt that the concept of a vaccine passport is actually a bit, um, a bit of a misnomer. It gives you the impression, just like our own passport, with, with passport you can travel to many places. No? And vaccine passport gives the connotation that holding that passport you can travel to many places. It actually wouldn't work like that. I, I don't believe it will work like that. Ultimately, it requires two different regions who look at each other and find that you are of the same risk profile and therefore you can travel to each other and you, you form an air travel corridor. You know, a bit like what Singapore and Hong Kong was trying to do, I mean, trying to form an air travel bubble. And so it starts with mutual recognition of vaccination certificates. Yeah? We have ours, the other region have theirs, mutually recognise that this is carried out under uh, good supervision, good vaccine. And once you recognize that, then next step is, so what if you recognize and have those, vac have, have those vaccination certificates? You can think about, you know, with that, less risk, can you reduce quarantine period or do away with quarantine if both regions are very safe? And these are, second, these are the next policy type questions that you then have to decide. So I think vaccine passports, quite a misnomer, what is more likely is two step. Number one, mutual recognition of vaccine certs. And number two, what to do with those vaccine certs. And you confer uh, the appropriate restriction relaxation. Thank you, Minister. Can we get the next question from the Business Times? Ray Ree, please. 
Hi, thanks for taking my question. Uh, I just wanted to ask, firstly, what kind of rate of vaccination for both single and double dose are you looking at before you would reopen borders and to allow more business and social activity, as well as to lift mask wearing guidelines, um, taking reference to developments in other countries such as in the US. Secondly, is that given current advisory, uh, what difference does it make from Singapore being in a circuit breaker state? So why not announce a full circuit breaker in state? And uh, given the current medical knowledge as well, how many months or years later should the same person receive vaccination um, a second time? Thank you. Any questions? Which one should we take? All right. Um, on the first question, what's the ideal rate of vaccination before we can open up and you know, resume many more activities? Again, I, our main focus now is to control the latest outbreak of cases, bring things under control, stabilize the situation. I think that must be our first priority. Once we have done that, then progressively we can get back on the path of reopening. And as we've said before, um, that path of progressive reopening, whether it's in terms of travel or in terms of restrictions within Singapore, safe distancing measures, depends on a range of factors. Partly, vaccination rates will matter, but it also depends on our assessment of um, our local situation, how, whether we are able to keep it under control, whether we see that, you know, um, situation is stabilized and then progressively we can start relaxing. Uh, so we will have to consider this whole range of factors in thinking about our next steps. Later on in the more distant future, we are also thinking about potential scenarios where, for example, if there is a scenario where the virus never goes away, it becomes endemic to the population and by then, Maybe towards the end of the year, we have a very high proportion of, the vac of Singaporeans and people in Singapore vaccinated. Then how might we think about dealing with the virus and living with the virus as, uh, as a reality in our lives? Uh, so that's, that's something that we are thinking about, but it's something down the road. I don't think we want to um, jump to that right now because now our first priority must be to control the outbreak and bring the cases down and stabilize the situation. On the second question, why not just do a circuit breaker or call it a circuit breaker? As I said, we continue to monitor the situation very closely and because there is a time lag to any of the measures we put in place, we will not know if um, whatever we have done, is well, well, we will only see the results, right? Maybe a week from now. In the meantime, we have to look at the current cases that we have picked up, the unlinked cases, make an assessment of how far it has spread into the community and whether or not there is, therefore, uh, whatever we have done is okay, sufficient for now, and therefore we can just hold the position or we might even consider further tightening. Right, so all of these possibilities are still open. We, are, we, we keep all these options open. We continue to review the matter very closely. And then if there is a need to, we may very well tighten measures further. Uh, with um, respect to vaccines, uh, we, we are studying this matter uh, further. And this uh, is also a matter of concern among many countries. Uh. Uh, the UK uh, started the vaccinations uh, late last year. Uh, we uh, started our vaccinations at the end of December. But if you take when we started to now, this is less than a year uh, in our experience. And we don't know whether the immune protection that uh, vaccinations have provided our citizens, whether th these would be long lasting and we need to follow this up. Uh, there, will, uh, there are studies that are underway tracking uh, uh, the immune response uh, in individuals that have been vaccinated. We've done it, uh, we're doing it locally as is uh, uh, being done in other countries as well. And we're looking to see whether the uh, antibody response as well as the cellular response uh, in our immune system, whether they continue to uh, be robust uh, to, to counter any future infection on the basis of a vaccination that's been given. If we look at experience from recovered uh, uh, cases uh, who have been exposed to the virus and uh, mounted an, an, uh, immune protection, 
we know that in some of these individuals, they do have a waning uh, protection uh, uh, and, and, uh, and, and beyond, for example, 270 to 300 days, uh, they, they, they do have a risk of getting reinfected again. And it may well be that, uh, that a similar situation occurs in the vaccinated uh, population, and therefore, we should uh, 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 think very seriously about the possibility of booster vaccinations being given uh, to our population. But we need more details to determine when is the optimal time uh, to do this and what is the strategy uh, for providing these uh, booster vaccinations. Another reason why we might consider booster vaccinations is if uh, a, a viral variant of concern emerges, which is not only highly transmissible, but in fact has a greater virulence compared to what we are seeing currently, where the, uh, the risk of getting severe infections and even the risk of dying now increases very significantly compared to what we are observing uh, this year or last year. And if that were the case, then there may be a need to design booster vaccinations specifically targeting these viral variants of concern to augment and enhance the protection that vaccination gives to our population. So we're watching this space very carefully, but these are possibly the reasons why we might need to have booster vaccinations. Uh, we, but we are, are unable to tell you definitively now when such booster vaccinations should be provided and how such booster vaccinations would be provided. This is still a, a, a subject of study. One short, short addition. In, in other words, you can't time the opening of economy, opening of borders and social restrictions with the rate of vaccination. That wouldn't be wise. You, you peg it to outcomes. What is the outcome in terms of infection, number of infection, number of unlinked infections, and what is the severity of infections? You know, how many people need oxygen? Uh, and these are the outcomes that we should be looking at. And the more mild the outcomes, the more we are confident that we can open up. Having said that, the outcomes is correlated with many things we do, including vaccinations, including taking precautions, avoid the super spreading settings and again uh, and correlated with all the precautions and risk management measures that we are taking so by taking proper steps including the major trust of vaccination we can deliver good outcomes which will then allow us to open up more Thank you, Ministers DMS. We have time for last two questions Members of media, gentle reminder to ask only one question please can we have the next question from Channel 8 polling, please? Hi, Ministers and DMS. We have a question for, uh, with regard to the extending the age group to 12 and 15. So, I mean, they're pretty young. So, some parents might have concern that I'm not sure if my kid actually have allergy problems. So, I'm not sure uh, any advice for them, like how... Should, should they allow their kids to actually take the vaccine? And also another question would be... Thank uh, you. Well, thank you very much for that one question. Um, uh, the Health Sciences Authority and the uh, Expert Committee for COVID-19 Vaccines has looked at this very carefully. And they believe that uh, the, uh, within the age group 12 to 15, the vaccine is safe. And not only is it safe, it is as effective as it would for adults uh, of, a, of a higher age group. So it's with that level of recommendation that we have confidence opening up and, uh, and uh, vaccination now to those uh, who are 12 to 15 years of age. Uh, so I would encourage uh, parents then when the opportunity uh, makes, uh, is available for their children now to get vaccinated and not to turn away and, 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 and uh, deny your children uh, of that opportunity for them to get that protection from the virus uh, and to get vaccinated. Uh, so so uh, we, we will continue to look at this carefully, uh, but at this time, the data that's been presented, the recommendations that come from my expert committee, they are strong recommendations and we have that confidence to, to recommend ch uh, parents of children to have the, their kids come forward and for the kids to get vaccinated. Thank you, DMS. We'll have the last question from BH. ITR, please. 
Hi, ministers and DMS. Um, just one question. Um, uh, what I, I mean, this new approach that uh, that we are taking to ensure as many um, as possible uh, to have access to the first dose instead of uh, completing the whole reg uh, regimen. Um, if we had started this earlier, do you think that it would have averted the current situation of uh, increased community cases that we are seeing uh, right now? I mean, what, what are your thoughts on that? I'll, I'll take that. I don't think so. I think it was correct for us to start with the first phase of our vaccination, focusing on the vulnerable as well as those on the front line, which are exposed to the most risk, and give them a maximum protection. So now, a very high percentage of them has been fully vaccinated, which I think also, to some extent, helped in this current outbreak. I think without those vulnerables and those on the front line fully vaccinated, the outbreak could have been worse. So I think, on hindsight, it was still the right thing to do. But now, as we enter a new phase of vaccination, we should adapt and try to cover as many people as possible. Uh, thank you. I know there, are, there may be some uh, questions that you wanted to ask and have not asked. Uh, do please uh, send them in. We will do our best to uh, re respond to these uh, questions as much as we can. Do feel free to send the questions to us and we will try to respond. So once again, thank you for coming to this uh, press conference. And the uh, final word is to encourage all of us to continue to remain vigilant. I want to thank all Singaporeans for s staying with us and for observing the rules and for helping us to control this uh, uh, outbreak. So thank you very much. Good night.